Good morning, everyone. It has been said that when there's great doubt, there's great awakening. When there's little doubt, there's little awakening. But when there's no doubt, then there's no awakening. So we're going to talk about doubt on this, the Sunday of Doubting Thomas. Uh, it is Sunday, April 19th, 2020. We're here at Ansley United Church in Markdale. I know uh, you are all watching from your own homes, wherever those are. Uh, welcome to our service this morning. And uh, the one thing we do want to say to you is that we hope that you're keeping well. We hope that you're keeping safe. And uh, we are here for the duration. We're going to keep doing these as long as we need to do, and we hope that it's meeting a need for you. I have with me our, uh, the Three Musketeer crew, which is myself, Reverend John Smith, uh, David Fries, our organist, and Tim Riley, who is our sound and tech guru. So the three of us are uh, putting on uh, worship for you today, and uh, we'll begin with our prelude. Sometimes even the light of Christ is hard to uh, get lit, but uh, let us uh, worship today in the light of Christ and with the light of Christ and by the light of Christ. We're going to start with our opening song, which is Spirit of Life, Come Unto Me. Uh, you have the words in front of you. I'm going to uh, uh, show the actions to you once again before we sing, in case uh, I know some of you have been wanting to learn how to do it. So Spirit is... Uh, uh, like a spiral of smoke going up off of your hand. Life is the two L's that come up through you. Come unto me. This is the sign for sing. Sing in my heart. Compassion is this, the stirring of compassion, which is right in your belly. Blow in the wind. Rise in the sea. Move in the hand. Giving life the shape of justice. And then roots, as if we're digging down deep into the soil. Roots hold me close. Uh, wings set me free. And then, again, spirit of life, come to me, come to me.
Thank you. Let us pray. Spirit of life, you call to our deepest selves. Now is the time to awaken. Your breath is our breath. Your pulse is our pulse. For now we can see we are one with you and with all of creation. Spirit of life, you mend our torn and broken spirits. You hear our isolation. You carry our fears on your wings. You know our sorrows and our weakness, for you live inside our beings. Help us let go of these, even for just these few moments this morning. Help us set down our burdens and feel the freedom. Help us remember the freedom of unfettered movement and give us courage to look to the day when we might rejoice again. Today, let our spirits be open. Let our spirits be held. Let our spirits be grasped in your deep embrace, O Spirit of life. Let our minds and our hearts and our bodies too be like the tulip stirring to life risking growth and seeking the embrace of the sun. Amen. Now our hymn is from our hymn book. It's number 402, We Are One. very much. And now a poem by Joyce Rupp. This poem is called, How Did They Know? How did they know it was time to push up through long wintered soil? How did they know it was the moment to resurrect while thick layers of stubborn ice still pressed the bleak ground flat? Still, the tulips knew. There's a hope-filled place in me that also knows when to rise. It is urged by the strong sun warming my wintered heart. It is nudged by the secret one calling, 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 arise, my love, and come. Like a dormant bulb, my heart stirs 
and hope comes dancing forth, not unlike the Holy One, kissing the morning sun, waving a final farewell to a tomb emptied of its treasure. So I invite you to uh, come together with me in prayer. And uh, as is our practice, there is a, a moment or two of quiet in the middle of this prayer. <clears throat> so let us pray. God of us all, these are trying times. We have our good days. We have our bad days. We have our ups and our downs. Still, we seek something which will guide us toward hope. We long for news of a new way forward, even if it is new. Our hearts desire connection. Our bodies are starved for simple human touch. Our spirits are withering with the long days to fill. In our time of doubt and fear, God help us find calm. In our time of anxious worry, our time of lonely isolation, our time of contactless transaction, help us find a bottom that will hold. Like the hull of a ship, like the rock of the escarpment, like the ground underneath the river, holding it as it rages. When we doubt your presence, God help us to dance until we sense you are dancing with us. Help us to sing your song underneath all songs. Help us to pray even when there are no words to pray and gentle us forward a step at a time toward a blessing, a blessing of time or person or gift or word. May there be today a bit of blessing hope to tide us over until banquet day. And now let's bring our voices together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And even though we are worshiping in separate places, still we are praying together. We are forming a community of light and hope. Let's join together in singing, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. We're just going to sing the first verse and the chorus. Then David's going to play a verse and then we'll join back in the chorus again.
Our scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John comes to a surprising but satisfying end in chapter 20. It's a beautifully told tale whose characters are drawn larger than life. And here we meet Thomas once again, whom we have not met in the other three Gospels, only here in John. Thomas has these conversations with Jesus, which we might call the every person conversations, because the things that he raises and discusses with Jesus are the very things that, that we would likely raise with him if we could. And so Thomas is us. His story gives us something absolutely critical and beautiful because it provides a place for you and me to enter into the narrative. And as I've said many times, if we can't enter into the narrative and make it our own, there really isn't that much point in reading or studying it. Here is the reading. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And with that, he breathed on them, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as the twin, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the room again, and Thomas with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So may we be blessed with this reading from the Gospel of John. Recently, I have received a lot of emails in my inbox from a number of corporations, many of whom I forgot that I might have transacted with over the last 10 or 15 years. They're all emailing me to see how I'm doing and whether there's anything I might do for them during this COVID-19 crisis. It's led me to be somewhat suspicious and cynical about the reason for all of those email contacts all of a sudden. COVID has got me doubting a lot of things, actually. I find that I'm kind of like Thomas almost every day. I'm doubting whether families can handle all of this time together. At some point, something's got to break, it seems. I'm also doubting whether after this time of uh, this pause time, when the earth has had a chance to regenerate and re resurrect itself, whether or not we'll just go back to the way things were and drive up carbon emissions once again. Oh, I'm doubting the economy as well. 
Of course, we need to pay taxes and to keep our, in order to keep our way of life, but I wonder if it's time for us to really take seriously the idea of a basic income for those below a certain poverty line. I kind of doubt that that will happen. I'm doubting some of the politicians, well, maybe not so much here in Canada, but those who seem to think that putting the economy back on track takes precedence over looking after the sick and dying. I doubt, too, that in our rush to get back to normal, we might forget that it's been kind of nice to have time to just bake a loaf of bread or put a whole puzzle together or actually finish a book what will normal be if we can't do some of those basic pleasurable things once things get back to normal? I also find myself doubting the claims of some religions and some religious folks who think that their version of faithfulness will protect them from the COVID-19 crisis. The idea that God is somehow on the side of the foolish is kind of foolish. So I'd like us to think a little bit about doubt because I've never actually experienced so much of it all at once at, at one point in my life. And what I really want to say to you is that I think doubt is actually a gift. It's a spiritual gift. It's a positive thing that can open us up to vistas of possibility which we may not have ever dreamed of before. And we have the best example of that in Thomas from the Gospel of John. He who makes that grand cameo appearance at the end of John's Gospel is not doing anything wrong by doubting the resurrection of Christ. I mean, if we had a lineup of people who doubted the resurrection of Christ, that would be a very long lineup. That would be a really long lineup with social distancing, wouldn't it? Thomas just wants more information, and it's fair of him to ask. If we notice closely, his doubt actually uh, is comes from a place of self-awareness where he's able to uh, admit openly his fears and his insecurities and his anxieties, which kind of get to the real heart of the matter and to the place where doubt comes from. Doubt, doubt comes from our innermost place. And I kind of like the idea that that Thomas, who really has no other part to play very much at all in the gospel, is the one who, because of his doubt, becomes a very faithful disciple. So his doubt is a kind of what I would call a positive doubt, which is, I don't know what to do with this doubt. And why I like that and why I call it positive is because it, it's ad admitting that it's there, admitting that it is uh, a part of your life and a part of your psychological makeup. And what I think it functions as a way to keep us open hearted, open to possibilities. Now, we all know there's another kind of doubt, the kind of doubt that I started off this uh, sermon with, that cynical, suspicious kind of doubt. And I'm going to be completely open with you and say, I think that that is where most of us live when it comes to doubt. We, we live within this culture of suspicion. And our doubt is very limiting, and it keeps us from seeing other possibilities. And so this kind of doubt I would call the closed-hearted kind of doubt, where we, we can't admit that it's coming from a deep place inside of us. And so we kind of close our heart to, to a new understanding or new insight. So doubt, then, if used properly within a spiritual context, is a gift of possibility. It's a positive 
open-hearted uh, presence of the spirit of life that is leading us forward into new places and new ways of thinking. Um, you can see how important it would have been for uh, Thomas uh, to represent all the people who after Easter and long after Jesus was uh, dead and gone, uh, how important it would be for people who had never seen Jesus or never knew him to kind of grasp this understanding of uh, what does it mean to have a living Christ inside of you or walking beside you when you had never known him or ever seen him as a person. And so that naturally leads to a place of great doubt and cynicism. And so Thomas, you see, functions as the person uh, in the story who voices those concerns, who voices those doubts and makes it normal and okay to have those kinds of thoughts. First, a story it's a story, one of my favorite stories. It's about a couple who, recently married, go to an island in the South Pacific for their honeymoon. The flights are long, as flights can be, and they're exhausted by the time they get to the uh, little hotel on the hillside on an island in the, Tah in the Tahitian Islands. This is the place they chose from the fancy brochure. The couple is met with the friendliest of welcomes, given the keys to their room and driven up the hill to find it in the middle of the night. Inside the room is a small lavatory and a couch. It's a nice pull-out couch, but clearly not what they were expecting from the honeymoon suite. But they're so tired they fall into bed, but soon can't sleep because they are so furious. They turn on each other. Why did you not let me make the reservation? How could you be so... You get the idea. And in a short while, their newly formed marriage lay in tatters, both doubtful that they had made a good match. In the morning, the couple heads down to the front desk. Once again, they are greeted with hugs and blessings, everyone knowing, of course, that they're on their honeymoon. But they are having none of it. They bitterly complain to the manager about their horrible night on the couch and want to switch rooms, of course. The manager says, Did you not open the door? Locked into anger and their doubt of each other, the couple had failed to see the doorway that led into the honeymoon suite from the little ante room they had stayed in. And when they opened the door, they found visions of paradise, expansive views of beauty, bowls of tropical fruit, and delights to share. Now, they were instantly in love again. And soon on their way to a lifetime of love and happiness, imagine if they had not found the door. So I love this story because it shows the two kinds of doubt so very clearly. The closed-hearted doubt is something that we're all familiar with. Deep down in our heart of hearts, there's a little voice inside of us that doubts. It even doubts who we are. It doubts the choices that we make. It doubts the stories that we tell about ourselves, uh, about who we are, about the kind of person that we think we are. It doubts the world around us. It doubts the people who tell us they love us or care for us because how could they be so blind? And these kinds of doubts limit our vision and keep us from seeing beyond our own ego needs. They keep us literally from seeing paradise on the other side of the door. Now, in our contemporary world, I believe that there is a pathological fear of naming these doubts within ourselves. And so, like the couple in the honeymoon suite, we turn on others. We project our fear and our doubt 
onto others. This is why it's so very easy for us to attack our politicians or to doubt the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Canada or whoever else we think is responsible for this mess that we're in. And this is why, on a religious uh, line, it's so easy for us to be an atheist in our culture to cast doubt upon God because, of course, it is very uh, de rigueur these days to cast doubt upon God. If there is a God, we might say, how come there is coronavirus. There can't be a love, a God of love when viruses take so many innocent lives, especially in long-term care homes. When we project our own fears and doubts outward, it keeps us from learning things about ourselves. It keeps us from seeing how nasty and dark those doubts can sometimes be. The life-saving soul gratifying truths are also kept from our vision so i think this is the operational dynamic of the thomas story here we are we have read to the whole end of john's gospel and we have witnessed the resurrection of christ along with mary and the other disciples and what we have witnessed here is that the soul of the greatest man who ever lived does not die. That his spirit still lives. That his soul cannot be killed. And so it forces us to ask our question. If that was true for Jesus, then is it also true for us, is it also true for me? And there is a source of great doubt. How can what happened to Jesus also happen to me? And if it's true for me, can it be true for everyone? And if it's true for everyone, then what does my religion do if it doesn't stretch far enough to allow for all of humanity to have a place? And so we reach a critical point where the story of Jesus becomes really relevant for us as we navigate this time in our lives, which is like no other time. As everything around us begins to change, perhaps permanently, we doubt if we can keep living and believing that the soul of humanity will survive. We doubt whether we can keep living and believing that the soul of humanity will rise again and conquer the fears and doubts and anxieties and compulsions of the world around us. We doubt whether we can keep on living wholly and fully because in these days, uh, while our spirits are awash in all of those heavy emotions, how can we still believe that there is a better day to come? So, as difficult as it will be for some of us to pull through these dark days, believe me, I am a survivor of depression, so I certainly know what that means. Despite all of that, Thomas learns the lesson that all of us can live by. He learns that the risen Christ will always be present, that the risen Christ is a part of our makeup and that the risen Christ will always rise in a time of great doubt and fear and anxiety. The risen Christ will be almost bodily present, a living presence. This is a critical moment for Thomas, 
But the story's not just about Thomas. It's about us. For here is revealed the most important thing. Christ is the embodiment of the eternal love of God. And the eternal love of God simply can't be killed. It can't be extinguished. It can't stay stuck in a tomb. The eternal love of God takes flesh. It lives. It lives in us. And so when we can't believe that about ourselves, when we doubt inwardly that there's anything at all good about us, especially when we're filled with all of that closed-hearted kind of doubt, the gospel is clear. Christ is risen. Christ is risen in you and in the person sitting right beside you. A French philosopher by the name of Paul Ricoeur claimed that our culture is awash in cynicism. He says we question the motives of everyone around us. We question our own motives. He said that we live as if the person coming to our door and ringing the bell is bad before we've even answered the door. We've already judged them and decided they are bad. Perhaps they are coming to sell us a new water heater. Perhaps they are trying to tell us that we are in the wrong church and condemned to hell if we don't switch. But perhaps... They have fresh muffins, fresh from the oven, and just want to alert you that they're leaving them for you on your doorstep. So the first kind of doubt limits our vision, locks us in, confines us to our suspicions and our fears. But the other kind of doubt the open-hearted kind accepts that the presence of the risen Christ is here with you now and could be in embodied in that neighbor at your door. So I want to suggest to you that the way for us now and the way for us forward is to stay open to new life and new possibilities and to walk through our life fully aware of our doubts and insecurities. God knows I have my own share, but with something else too. And I'd like to call it a wager, like a bet, like buying a lottery ticket, a wager on the living, resurrected, spirit of life. A bet that the human heart and the human spirit, that place where the living Christ is most alive, will still rise in you, in those around you, and in our world. Even now, in this terrible time, this kind of doubt can be a spiritual gift. May it be so for you today and always. Amen. Well, our hymn is uh, from the hymn book as well. It's number 168. Uh, we're just singing three verses of the risen Christ.
friends, may the living Christ be within you this day. May the living Christ give hope to your heart and give life to your spirit. May the living Christ be found in all whom you meet and all whom you engage with this day. Most of all, may the living Christ fill our hearts with hope for a world renewed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.